Welcome everyone. My name is Robin Wilson and I'll be leading this webinar on how to get started with Manufacturing Execution Systems, or MES. And what I'm going to be presenting here is not theoretical, but rather based on our learnings from working with manufacturers and understanding some of the struggles that they've encountered. And this is really what we do here at Brock. And some of the things I'm going to be sharing are things that we admittedly learned through the School of Hard Knocks over the past 30 years in this business. So I hope you find it informative and helpful. The topics I'm going to cover with you today are, first of all, what is a manufacturing execution system? I'll share what we at Brock Solutions are seeing and hearing in the MES market. And the heart of this presentation will be around sharing best practices on how to get started on an MES transformational journey. And I'll do this by demonstrating three case studies of actual MES implementations that we have led. I'll follow that with a brief overview of Brock Solutions and finish with some polling questions for the audience. To begin, I wanted to briefly ground the presentation and describe what a manufacturing execution system is. So a manufacturing execution system is a level three or layer three system that links your business systems or your ERP systems or layer four and the real-time operational plant control systems such as your PLCs, which are generally classified as layers zero through two. And just to clarify, these are often referred to by their acronym of MES, or sometimes MOM, which stands for Manufacturing Operations Management. So to kick things off, what we often see and hear in the marketplace are organizations that are asking themselves some of the following questions. How do we make sure we're selecting the right MES product supplier? What role should our product vendor and system integrators play? Many organizations are confused and believe, rightly or wrongly, that their ERP system is already covering a lot of the typical MES functions. How do we modernize our manufacturing environment? How do we roll out new solutions across different areas and facilities? And is there a way we can improve the way we operate, or should we just upgrade with replacements of the same solutions? Who should be engaged from our organization, and who should own our MES transformation internally? And a lot of companies are asking themselves, should we just do a quick prototype on a single machine or a line, and then see how it works? So before I get into the meat of the presentation around best practices on how to get started with an MES journey, I have a few questions that I'd like you to think about. The first is, does your organization understand what MES and MOM is and the value that it can provide? Has your organization started an MES or MOM initiative only to have to stop, regroup, and restart? Do you currently have an MES or MOM solution implemented and you're trying to figure out how to go about upgrading or replacing that solution? Have you struggled to define a vision and a roadmap for how to roll out an MES implementation? So if any of these questions have resonated with you, I just want to let you know that you're not alone. And these are very common questions and struggles of some great organizations that we've worked with. Almost all of the MES transformational programs we've been involved with have been with manufacturers who have needed help with the answers to these questions. The unfortunate thing is that there's not one right answer or silver bullet in terms of the best way to go about getting started on an MES journey. So my goal in this presentation is to share some learnings and best practices through the use of specific case studies in hopes that it will give you some ideas on ways that you can successfully start your own MES transformation. So the first slide I'd like to present is for a framework case study. This was a large manufacturer who was looking to replace over 20 years of disparate, obsolete MES systems that they had developed, spanning multiple facilities. Many of these systems had been extended well past their intended life cycle, had become unsupportable, and were thought of as ticking time bombs. So you can see in the image on the right, that they had a centralized ERP system, which was SAP. And they're also at the beginning of a product definition management system implementation, which you can see by the gray box, which is PDM. And the rest of their real-time applications across all of their various facilities and sites were confusing, to say the least. And as you can see in the diagram, they had quite a large number of these obsolete legacy systems, a lot of them not tied together well, 
and they had many systems performing the same functions. And just as an example, their inventory was managed in 15 different systems. So this manufacturer was trying to figure out, what do we do with this mess? Luckily, they had a very visionary senior VP who had a five-year vision for their manufacturing operations. And he was looking at this spaghetti mess of applications and saying, manufacturing in these systems can no longer be a black box. We need to understand what these systems do, and we need to figure out how we can drive business value from our manufacturing environment. And so with that backdrop, they came to Brock and said, okay, how do we get started? And they gave us eight weeks to do a framework study to help them figure that out. And as we got started working with this customer, they started asking some of the many common questions. So how do we replace our legacy systems, these ones that are no longer supported and obsolete? What software vendor should we partner with? What does the implementation roadmap look like and how long is this all going to take? How do we incorporate what's happening in our controls layer, ERP layer, and other external systems? And what are some other benefits we should hope to achieve? And what kind of return on investment can we get if we invest in this? So as we kicked off the engagement, something that we're always keeping in the back of, of our mind is the idea of what goes where and how do we draw the line between our ERP, our MES, and our controls layers. So I wanted to share this slide quickly to illustrate some of the criteria that we think about when we're helping manufacturers make these decisions. If you have high rates of transactions and decisions are required in near real time, you might want to include more functions in your MES system versus your ERP, and your line will go up. Conversely, if you have low rates of transactions and your decisions can be delayed, it may be appropriate to have more functions in your ERP layer. When looking at where to draw the line between your MES and controls layers, if you think of things like safety and responsiveness, and if those need to be maximized, you may move some of these functions down to the controls layer. If safety and responsiveness aren't factors, and functions are relying on information coming from other areas of your facility, you may want to include these functions in the MES layer. Getting back to this specific manufacturer, through the framework study, we were able to help them answer a lot of the questions that they were asking in the beginning. For vendor selection, we developed an evaluation criteria and a weighting matrix. And while keeping their manufacturing needs in mind, we began looking through all the different obsolete legacy systems and helped them determine what functions they required in the future state. And keeping in mind the criteria from the previous slide on what goes where, we collectively mapped where those functions should reside be it in the controls layer, the MES, the ERP, or perhaps in other external systems. We also look at the various priorities and risk factors with replacing these obsolete legacy systems. This helped to create and drive the road mapping process and allowed us to put a high priority items with low risk near the beginning of the road map. And during this process, we also looked at what they would need to do to other systems in their manufacturing environment to support the MES implementation specifically around controls upgrades that would be needed to help feed the MES system with its required data. We're able to help them determine what the overall architecture should, took, should look like. So looking at that previous messy spaghetti diagram and coming up with one simplified vision that shows what the various functions are and where they should reside. And we're looking at potential benefits of replacing the obsolete legacy platforms. We looked at things, what could be achieved, things like uh, with the addition of downtime monitoring and waste tracking? How could streamlining their quality and scheduling process help them get more done with less resources? And how could an improved in inventory management system reduce raw material inventory on hand? And with all these factors, we looked at the real dollars and cents, so the savings that they could achieve and put together a full ROI analysis for them. So Working collaboratively with this manufacturer and pulling together the user requirements, the vendor selection criteria, the architecture, and the roadmap, we're able to determine the best way for them to get started on their MES journey. And in the end, this framework study laid out the groundwork and became the stepping stone to arguably one of the most successful MES implementations in North America, which is still ongoing and has already spanned eight years in eight different facilities. And what's interesting to wrap up this case study is that looking back on the framework study that we did eight years ago now, 
it's really incredible to see how closely that roadmap that we developed and the architecture that we developed in the beginning was followed over the past eight years with this, with this manufacturer. The second case study I want to present is of a manufacturer who is looking to expand their production capacity by building a new greenfield facility. They had the vision and foresight to know that the MES could be a benefit to them, but they weren't really clear on what their requirements would or should be, or even what software vendor they should be looking at. They had a wide variety of stakeholders from different internal groups, and each had different responsibilities to ensure that they could get the new site up and running. But they were struggling with how to link the demands from their various stakeholder groups, from manufacturing IT, business IT, operations, and others. Because this, was a, because this was a greenfield facility, it was easy for the manufacturer to say, you know, these are the machines that we need to make our products. But what they struggled with was what is it that their MES system should do and what functions should they implement. So some of the things that they told us initially that they were interested in, including knowing things like how efficiently would they be running and what materials did they have to have on hand. So this manufacturer came to Brock and asked for our help in defining the functional requirements for what their MES system needed to do and to help them determine what goes where in their overall solution architecture. So as we went through this exercise, again, a number of the common questions surfaced. They were still designing the overall manufacturing processes, so how could they figure out what their MES should do? How do they pick a software vendor and how do they select a systems integrator? And what information should they be providing to these partners? How do they roll out MES as portions of the plant come online? And then there, is there a way that MES can help their plant start up? So having a function maybe like performance management, would that help them ensure that the machines that they're getting from their OEMs are running as efficiently as they're supposed to? And what type of information do they need to give to their OEM partners? so that they can ensure that their machines and systems that are being delivered are ready to support their MES system. So we kept these questions in mind as we started working with different stakeholder groups to get their various requirements. And what we did was we walked them through a process in which we created workflow diagrams. So to start with, what we're looking at here is a sample of one completed workflow diagram. And when we develop these workflows, we start at level zero at the bottom and we map out all of the physical processes. So what actually needs to be done to make the product? Then we started to look at what benefits MES could provide and what are some of the functions that could help. We also looked at things like, where would they need to move around materials? Where do they need to send information up and down to their controls layer? And what information would come down from ERP for things like orders and recipe definitions? And what information would they need to send from the MES layer back to their ERP system? So we laid all this out through workflow diagrams such as this one, which provide an easy way for the manufacturer to start seeing what it is that MES can do for them and where it is they'll start to see their benefits. To dive a little deeper, each of these blocks on the, on the workflow diagram has additional information available in the background that's stored in what we call the use case. The use cases have a more detailed description of the action and include things like what's going to trigger that block to happen, and what steps need to occur when the action is happening. And along with these detailed use cases, we began to look at what the various user interfaces should look like. So whether we're looking at handheld scanner screens, web screens, or other screens. And in this example, we're looking at a handheld scanner screen, which is depicted by the scanner icon on the workflow. So through this workflow, use case, and user interface development process, we're able to help this manufacturer understand what, the, what their vision of MES is and what it should look like so they could become better aligned internally and move forward to the implementation phase. These workflows then became the heart of the functional specification and were used throughout the full project life cycle from development through testing, implementation, and verification. The third case I'd like to look at was a manufacturer that was embarking on a broad-based manufacturing transformation. They had a wide variety of manufacturing sites and made a lot of different products and product families across their facilities. They believed that MES could be a catalyst to help them standardize their manufacturing systems and operations. 
And they tried over a period of five years to get an MES project going to support this, but they were never able to get their project funded or approved. Over those years, they struggled internally through alignment issues. Even though most stakeholders believed that MES could help them, there was not a clear aligned understanding of, first of all, what MES is and what it is not, but what MES should look like across their varying facilities. So some of the questions we heard early on in this engagement were, how do we agree on standard functions between multiple business units and facilities? And how can we map those to the various software packages we're considering? How do we make sure we're capturing the potential benefits so we can get commitment on the investment that we're going to make and get our funding approved? How do we go about evaluating the various software packages? And how can we make an informed decision on the best fit for our operations? And when we're looking at these various software packages, what are the different infrastructure requirements? So how many servers are we going to need? What type of networks are we going to need to be able to support this? And because of the struggles that they had been having, how do they align their IT and operation stakeholders? So this manufacturer came to Brock and asked us to help them do a functional specification, including a study on the potential return on investment, as well as to help them choose a software vendor. And one of the big things they were interested in was seeing beyond the typical presentation where of the various software vendors. And for this, for the software selection piece, what we suggested was to use a process we developed that we call a day in the life. And in this process, we start again by developing the requirements through the workflow process. And then we give these workflows to the different software vendors. We then give them some time to prepare a working demo of what a day in the life would look like for this manufacturer using their software platform. So not only does this allow the manufacturer to see what a real functioning system would look like, but it allows them to evaluate the commitment of their vendors to their organization. So as an example, if a software vendor comes to the day in the life and presents a demo of a bakery and you're a steel manufacturer, it's clear to see they're just using their stock demo and they didn't take the time to put something together that, that you as the manufacturer can see and touch. So as we worked with this manufacturer, we started by coming up with a high level plan, which was broken down into various components. The first being the planning stage. So what are the production orders and how are we going to define our bill of materials and download orders and recipes? How do we configure the system to know when to prompt for quality checks? Next we looked at the pre-start. So how could they know what material inventory they have on hand? And how could they look ahead at production orders and make sure that they have the right material for the right orders ready for production? Next was the run phase, which included actually tracking the downtime, tracking the execution of the orders and material consumption, and prompting operators for those quality components. Following the running phase, we looked at how orders would be closed, and how would we capture material inventory movements. Next, we looked at how to do analysis on the information collected throughout the process. So how do we make sure we're capturing all the information we need to be able to report on things like track and trace and genealogy? And finally, we looked at the infrastructure requirements. So what are the networking requirements necessary to ensure that the solution can be deployed and supported in a sustainable way? So following this very broad-based, high-level description of the functionality, we jumped into the same workflow process as illustrated in the previous case study. And once the workflows were created and we achieved alignment internally between the various stakeholder groups and various facilities, we shared them with the three shortlisted software vendors and facilitated the day in the life process between the vendors and the manufacturer. And the final piece of this engagement was helping the manufacturer tie everything together and help them determine the expected return on investment. Now this was not just doing a high level number, but actually providing a breakdown of where they could expect to see the savings come from, be it from inventory reductions or material management improvements, or maybe scheduling changeover improvements. So what were the common threads throughout these case studies, and why were these case studies successful where other ones we've heard of have stalled and or failed? One of the things was strong upper management with the vision and leadership required to be able to communicate to everyone across the organization that this is how we're going to operate, and this is why an MES is important, and this is how we can and will realize the value from it. 
In each of our case studies, a core team with the cross-section of people was established. I'm going to leave that point for now and talk a little bit more about the core team on the next slide. Another thing that was important was taking a step back early on in the engagement and clearly defining what goes where and how do we draw that line. So a lot of these organizations had a wide variety of systems performing similar functions, like we talked about the inventory function. It's often split between many different obsolete or legacy systems, so we wanted to look at the best places for those functions to reside. In all these engagements, we had to make sure that from the get-go, we had a firm understanding of the functional requirements and business goals before starting with an implementation. We've seen a lot of projects and programs stall or fail because organizations are jumping in without having a firm understanding of the what and the why. And all of these case studies had strong industry partners focused on best practices, business value, and implementing the most effective technologies for the manufacturer's real-time landscape. And as important as it is to make sure a thorough analysis has been completed, we often find companies can overanalyze and stall or derail programs due to a lack of forward momentum. So in our experience, we find time boxing analysis activities provides a happy medium to ensure the requirements are gathered, but also that things keep moving forward so the manufacturer can start realizing the benefits in a suitable time frame. So on the previous slide, I introduced briefly the idea of, of a core team. And to explore this a bit more, I first want to emphasize a couple of key points. The first being that MES implementations are not silo applications. They're not just an IT project or an operations project or a maintenance project. In order to be successful, you need to involve and align various stakeholder groups. The second point is that when you're looking at MES, it's a space. It's not a thing. MES is not something you can buy like a widget and plop it in and it's going to do everything as is right out of the box. You need to understand the capabilities of MES as it applies to your business, so what functions it should include and where you're going to get the business value from it. So to help with these two points, we find it's important to establish an MES core team that's empowered by leadership and has an MES champion. And when you're looking at setting up your core team, you want to make sure you get individuals who are respected within your organization. They need to know the organization, and especially they need to be forward thinking. Because as you're looking at these MES journeys, you don't have to just stick with the status quo. So these are drivers for change and drivers to empower your workforce and your operators and others to have more information to make better decisions. You want to have people representing various stakeholder groups from operations and supply chain, engineering, IT, and quality. And depending on the size of the implementation, we typically see core teams ranging from three to six people. And oftentimes, some of the team members, as you move from the beginning phase of a project from the requirements gathering through to the implementation phase, some of the team members may change, and that's okay. You want the core team to be responsible for interacting with any third-party teams, such as system integrators or product vendors. And you want the core team to also be responsible for driving change management and managing users and other stakeholders' expectations. So looping back to the main topic of this presentation, the main question was how to get started with MES. So I'd like to summarize with the following two slides. As I mentioned in the beginning, there's not one silver bullet, but depending on the level of maturity of your organization, there are many different ways that you can start. We typically have been able to see three broad underlying drivers or categories that companies would fall under. And the first of these drivers I'd like to look at is alignment. So if there's no top to bottom vision within your organization, and maybe there's still a lot of questions around what MES is and how it can be beneficial, our recommendation would be to start with education and a day in the life process, as we saw in the third case study. At a very high level, this would be used to define the requirements and to look across the organization and show what a day would look like if you were using MES. The second driver we typically see is obsolescence. So this is typical in organizations that have many disparate or obsolete legacy systems where they're just trying to keep things running. So a lot of times we see people that are ordering parts through eBay or wherever they can find them and they're stockpiling them in the back of their maintenance shops. We see a lot of these organizations having spaghetti-like infrastructures, like in my first case study. 
And the best approach we've seen in these instances is to start with a framework study. In these examples, it's crucial to define not only what goes where as they start to replace these systems, but also what's the order and schedule looking like for doing the replacement. So what does the program roadmap look like? And finally, we've worked with organizations that are more advanced in terms of their MES journey and are looking to leverage MES as a part of a business transformation. They typically know what MES is and the benefits that they can achieve, and often these organizations are aligned internally very well. In cases like this, a good starting point may be jumping right in and developing your workflows and functional specifications. But really, the common element to help get started for all of these different business drivers for us is the use of the workflows. The workflows help define what work gets done as well as the what goes where. So what's appropriate for your ERP versus your MES versus your controls layer. They also help to educate manufacturers on where the opportunities are to drive standardization, business value, and savings. In addition, what we recommend if you're looking to get started on an MES journey is to see it for yourself and learn from others. The MES community is very large and engaging. So whether you're looking at software providers or system integrators, there's a lot of knowledge out there that can help you get started. I'd also recommend taking a look at the MESA organization, which stands for Manufacturing Enterprise Solution Solutions Association. MESA International is a nonprofit community of manufacturers, software suppliers, and integrators who are dedicated to this space. It's non-commercial, and it's basically a one-stop shop for education, best practices, as well as the opportunities to talk and meet with people that have been at various stages of their journeys. So Brock believes very highly in this organization. We actually chair the Americas Board. And we participate in a lot of their white papers and guidebooks that you can find on their website. So to conclude on the topic of how to get started with MES, I hope I've given you some insight into what other manufacturers in this space have struggled with and what they've done to overcome these struggles. As I mentioned in the beginning, there really isn't one right answer or silver bullet in terms of the best way to get started with an MES journey. But I hope through demonstrating these real-life, practical examples of how other manufacturers got started, it'll help you think about some of the ways that you can start successfully with your own MES journey. And I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share these stories. Now I'll just move on to a brief overview of Brock Solutions. So Brock Solutions is an engineering solutions company with over 420 engineering professionals covering automation, MES, and IT landscapes. We're a privately held organization with an employee ownership model. We have two North American headquarters, which are located in Dallas, Texas, and Kitchener, Ontario. And we also have additional offices located all around North America supporting our customers. At Brock, our whole approach to business is to partner with customers when they're looking at MES or automation programs or transformations. Our goal is to understand their business. So why are they embarking on these programs? and also to understand what their level of understanding is to move forward. So we want to not only help them get started, but to continue through to successful implementations in the spirit of a long-term partnership. And at Brock, we're recognized by Control Engineering as a Hall of Fame member in the large size category for being selected as the System Integrator of the Year. And also, as mentioned previously, we're heavily involved with the MESA organization and have served as numerous leadership positions. So are you looking to talk to someone about getting started with MES or MOM? Are you struggling with any decisions in your MES or MOM journey, and do you need some help? Would you like any more information or to dive deeper into any of the topics covered today? So if you answered yes to any of these polling questions, our contact information is linked here below. We want to thank you for listening here today.